Jim, we are back here with a late night drive through question exclusive to tinyurl.com slash corny YouTube. And you know why it's the late night drive through even if you're listening to it early in the morning, because we're staying open even later now to uh, wade our way through these these thousands and thousands of questions that the cult of Cornette has has asked that only I can answer. Well, here's a question from Daniel in Vancouver. Something that I'm interested in and something I know Jim can shed some light on with the current product WWE, we see guys go from heel to face good to bad over and over again from the years of listening to this fine program, hearing about the awesomeness that was the King Jerry Lawler. Can you give me some examples of how the King went back and forth and why the people believed it? Well, and, and you conventional wisdom is that you shouldn't turn somebody back and forth too often or too much because it devalues, which is, is correct. There have been people that were able to get away with it. And a, a lot of them have been in the Tennessee territory, Jerry Lawler, Jimmy Valiant switched back and forth a lot, but it, he was still handsome, Jimmy Valiant. And, and once he got to that cool status, he, he pretty much stayed a baby face from that point on, but uh, he was always over. Uh, just being himself. Lawler was always over because he was a hometown guy and because he was so equally fascinating at, at, at both roles. But even then uh, he took breaks. Unfortunately uh, from the broken leg, the year of 1980, the territory was doing the shits by the time it was over with, but he was gone for a year. So it got him over in a whole new way again. And he would try to take shorter breaks after that uh, rather than just flip flopping and turning back and forth uh, you know, he would, he would try to take a break every so often, lose a loser, leave town match, and then be forced to come back six or eight weeks later, but try to create some hunger. But, um, but now with the, with the WWF turn, WWE turns for one thing, nobody believes him anymore anyway. And it just, when a guy doesn't stay true to what he could be, that the people may see in him just for the sake of turning to freshen him up, that's, you know, the, the problem is how can I miss you if you won't go away? The best thing for these guys would not be turn them more than once. It'd be to run them as, as something, turn them to the other side, and then some way or another they should go away for a year or two. And then they could come back in as big stars again instead of staying around so long that everybody's fucking tired. Um, you're tired of, of working there and they're tired of watching you. But it doesn't happen anymore because nobody wants to let anybody out of a contract while there's still any value to them at all. So as a result, nobody ever goes away. Do you have a favorite Jerry Lawler babyface or heel turn? And also, what are your thoughts about when he turned heel right before he got injured in 1979? Um, that actually for performance was my favorite, but it drew probably the least amount of money. But you got to see him cutting those promos every week on TV and the gradual thing and the and the – you know, the, the gradual way that he got a little bit more cocky and got a little bit more back to the old king and and uh, the quirks and little smart comments he'd make to Bill Dundee and et cetera, et cetera. But the, the probably the biggest heel turn in terms of money that he ever did was in 74, which people have forgotten. The way that the program with Jackie Fargo was set up that, uh, God, I don't even have the book here in front of me, but uh, that where they worked that summer, you know, uh, 13 times, did like seven or eight sellouts and etc. cetera. Um, Lawler turned babyface. In, in January 74, he and Jim White had, had been the top heel team and it set the indoor Coliseum attendance record at 11,000 plus in 1973. And then uh, Jim White left the territory and Lawler for four or five months was was still a heel with different partners. I think the Scorpion, Don Duffy under a mask and maybe Don Green. And then in January, suddenly he switches babyface and I believe <clears throat> helps Eddie Marlin in a dust up against the masked infernos and their manager, J.C. Dykes. And it ends up that Lawler teams with Eddie Marlin and Sam Bass, Lawler's manager, went with him, became a baby face too, to get even with J.C. Dykes. And for like three weeks, at least here in Louisville, it was Lawler and Eddie Marlin against the Infernos. Well, then the Inferno with J.C. Dykes and Sam Bass in the corners, then the Infernos hurt Eddie Marlin. And finally, Lawler begs Jackie Fargo. 
his idol, his hero, to be his partner so that they can get those dirty, no good infernos, right? And they have the match in the Mid South Coliseum. And as soon, once again, boom, 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 Fargo gets in trouble. He makes the tag to Lawler. And he slumps in the corner, and Lawler jumps in with his fists ready to pounce on those infernos, and he turns around and looks at Fargo, and he starts kicking the shit out of him. And Sam Bass jumps in and starts kicking the shit out of him. And the infernos jump up and sit on opposite turnbuckles, on a top turnbuckle, and just let this whole thing happen. So it's all Lawler on top of Fargo, and he breaks his ribs, allegedly. And as a result of that, when they played that, they kept Fargo out for like two months. When he came back to second Ricky Gibson in a Southern title match against Lawler, it sold out just because Fargo was going to be back in the corner. And then they sold out the next week when it was the first Lawler and Fargo match. And they sold out the next week. And they they did huge business all summer off of just turning Jerry Lawler babyface for eight weeks and then that one angle. And that's the old Lee Dusty angle in 1980 before it ever happened. Well, there you have it. Wow. And one last question. You bring up Sam Bass. Unfortunately, there isn't too much footage of Sam Bass around. He, of course, perished in that car accident. But when it comes to Jerry Lawler's managers, it seemed that some of the other ones he had, they didn't really do anything. They were just <laughs> kind of stooges or lackeys. There was Mickey Poole, Danny Davis for a little while, even Jimmy Hart before... Lawler got injured and Hart became the lead heel manager. He just kind of stood there. What are your thoughts on those managers? And there you have Sam Bass also. Um, Here's the thing. Sam Bass was probably the most important and the most identified, most important to Lawler and most identified with Lawler because he was Lawler's first manager. And the reason why that, that he was even involved was because they knew they had, you know, the the kid had talent. I mean, obviously, from the start, they sent Lawler to Montgomery, Alabama, I believe, that, that, to that territory where, where Jim White was working. And Sam Bass, who had, at various points had been like, I think, Jim White's brother and had, had, had wrestled uh, and, and was not a, a good worker to me at all. <laughs> His shit looked horrible, but that was part of the appeal of Sam Bass when he got over uh, but Sam was the manager because Lawler was this rookie kid and they needed to teach him. And, it, and so when they brought him to Memphis and the three of them together, they set all those attendance records as a tag. They were the hottest tag team over the uh, Von Brauners and the Infernos and the, the interns and all the classic Southern heel teams because they were different and they took big bumps and blah, blah, blah. And Anyway, Lawler kept Sam Bass because he was a very important part of it. Uh, he would say just enough on the interviews to be an old country, you know, hillbilly wearing cowboy boots you didn't want to fuck with. And his work was meh, but as being the stooge at ringside to interfere at the right time, that's how they got the heat together. Lawler would give him the Iggy, he'd toss the boot in. Or he'd interfere with the toss the chain, or he'd interfere it right to this point. And Lawler did all the talking and Lawler did almost all the working, but Sam Bass had as much of the heat because he, anything he did was designed to make people mad. So he was a heat magnet. Um, but that was, that was the same function of Lawler's managers. They were all part of the package, but they, everything revolved around Lawler. 